So let's talk a little about plagiarism. Uh, I pulled a dictionary definition, by the way. I updated these slides this morning. It's, I don't know. I don't know how you guys prepare slides. And usually they tell people, oh, you yeah, do it weeks ahead and you know, prep and practice and whatever. Uh, I'll sometimes do them the night before, but I often go through them the morning before, and then they're fresh in my mind. And I don't have to be constantly looking at the shoulder. But so, definitely, di our dictionary definition of plagiarism. So, you're using another person's work or ideas. That's part one, and you're not adequately giving them credit. That's part two. So, it's a pretty simple definition. The problem, of course, as in just about anything it sounds like it has something to do with law, is there's a lot of wiggle room in here. So I do have a, one rather humorous, I hope, maybe it's, maybe it's only humorous for my generation, but uh, let me find it. See, there's a nice communication to run into mathematicians and to wonder, therefore, Oh, not that way. <laughs> Here, in part of explanation, perhaps, it's the story of the great Russian mathematician Nikolai Ivanovich Lobachevsky. <laughs> Who may be the genius I am today? The mathematician that knows all the world. Who's the professor that made me that way? The greatest that ever got job on his own. I have never forget the day I came to meet the day of In one word, he told the secret of success in mathematics. Plagiarize. Plagiarize. That no one else is going to plagiarize. Remember why the good Lord made your eyes, so don't change your eyes, but plagiarize, 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 I'll be sure all of you got it, research. Since I made this my mind, I was not the same. And that is, so, the point of that is that research and plagiarism have gone together pretty much as long as there's been either one. So, some perspectives on this. First off, we're talking about ideas. We're talking about words, we're talking about images, we're talking about publications. They could be in journals and paper, they could be out on the web, they could be Twitter leads, they could be just about anywhere. And of course, in this day and age, we come to think of those sorts of sources of information as being free. But in fact, research and the words and the ideas that convey it are the product of somebody's labor. <laughs> and therefore they have some value. And there is an origin of this. And so part of what plagiarism is about is recognizing the fact that the person who actually created this, or more often I should say the group, it's pretty rare to find research done by one person, that that one person is, um, is the, or that one person or group is the other. Uh, is this mic loud enough to hear me? Or do I need to just walk out in the audience? Mm. You're fine. Good? I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> So, who owns it? Typically the person who wrote it, although it's not always that easy. So, for example, if I do research here at the university while I'm being paid, do I own it or does the university own it? So the university has policies on that. In most cases, I own it, but in some cases, the university owns it. There's things like agreements for sharing patents. Second piece of this is. And the easiest way to avoid plagiarism, and this is what I tell all my undergraduates, is say, if you simply cite, if you simply tell me that you're there, you have avoided plagiarism. Now, that does not automatically mean as an undergraduate that you get an A on the term paper, and that does not automatically mean as a master's or a PhD student putting in a thesis that your committee says, rah, 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 that's great, sign here, yes, you get a degree. But it at least means you avoid the issue of plagiarism. The other, the other things it does, it enables readers to find that related work. So, and of course, we get into all sorts of rules and regulations. Frankly, they've always driven me nuts. You know, is it APA style or is it some other journal's style? And, you know, do you put the reference in the square brackets or do you cite the name and then the year? And, you know, all that weird stuff. And whatever field you're in, you're going to have to learn whatever the conventions are for proper citation. But the point of it is all the same. Can the reader of this information find what it is you're citing? Are you giving them enough information to go out and find it? 
And of course, in the modern world, typically you just give them a hyperlink and that's good enough. Okay? The other piece of this, and this is where the ethics part kicks in, is being honest about what your own contribution is. And this is something that editors and journal, jur and, uh, and, and funding agency, program directors and what have you, are naturally very much concerned with. Okay? They want to know that you're being honest about what is your unique contribution. Now, it's pretty rare that you just invent an idea out of thin air, totally unconnected to every other idea that's ever been published. And you write it up and you, you know, make a million bucks or become famous or whatever the end result of that point is. So in order to show your originality, you need to show what you've borrowed from elsewhere, show the lineage, you know, chapter one of every thesis or dissertation ever written, the giant long you know, literature review, is basically to show where did, you know, on what base are you building? Where is that lineage? Okay. Then from there, are there other ideas that are similar to yours? Are there other ideas that are different from yours? And most importantly, how does your contribution take it to the next step? How does your contribution build on all that work before you? How is your contribution 2% better than another way that somebody did this, or hopefully 5 or 20 or 50% better? Or maybe if you're truly lucky, how does your contribution represent a completely fundamentally different way of doing things? Okay. So those are all aspects of plagiarism and of originality. All right, now let's take a, I teach in the business school, and I'm trained as an accountant and an IT person, but you know, when you go to a business school, you gotta learn all the other disciplines, okay? And um, one of the disciplines that you have to learn when you're in a business school is marketing. And marketing gives you some pretty valuable perspectives for life in lots of places, and research is one of them, okay? And as a matter of fact, it was a senior professor very early in my career, before I was tenured, who kind of took me aside and said, Steve, there's a concept I'm not sure you've got quite, quite down right, okay? Actually, two concepts. The first concept he gave me was, remember, you're producing for somebody who's going to essentially buy this. Think of, your, think of the journal editor. Think of the review team. If it's a dissertation, think of the dissertation committee. If it's a textbook, think of the professors who are going to you know, assign it to their students. Somebody in the end is going to buy this, whether or not they actually put money forth. You know, they are consumers, and you need to treat them as, as such. The second one he gave me, which isn't all that relevant to this discussion, is he said, always have a product mix. You know, every article doesn't have to go in an A journal, Steve. You know, spread the work around a little bit. It's nice to have a, it's nice to have a selection of things. Okay. So from the point of view of a journal editor, what questions are they most concerned with? Well, first and foremost, they're concerned with the concept of originality. And they're concerned with it for a couple of reasons. Number one, if this is an actual research journal, then they expect, and their readers expect, that everything in there is going to be original. It's going to represent something new. If it's not, then nobody's going to want to read the journal, and its rankings are going to go down, and they're not going to be able to sell it. Okay. But the second issue that they're worried about originality is, frankly, they don't want to get sued. And yes, you sign all sorts of releases and waivers and what have you that say, you know, when you submit an article, it says, yes, this is my work. But, you know, one thing they, one thing they teach in business law is, you know, pretty much anybody can sue anybody anytime over anything. So they don't just sue the journal, you know, you don't just sue the author. You sue the author, you sue the journal, you sue the university where the author works, et cetera, et cetera. And you hope someone there and there's enough deep pockets. So types of things they're looking at as they drill into that, you know, what's the balance of the original content and the unoriginal? And unoriginal is kind of a harsh term there, but back to the previous slide, you're building on the work of others. Presumably you've got that first section or first two sections that are reviewing the past literature, and then you go on to show how what you're doing is new. So there's always a balance of new and old. And so they're looking, what's that balance? Is it 90-10? Is it, you know, 99-1? Or is it 199? You know, they're looking for a balance. The other things they're looking for, has any of this been published elsewhere? And of course, that's a pretty thing, easy thing to do in the modern age. You know, if you were a research-oriented grad student 50 years ago, there were probably three journals in any given field. Every professor read them every month, every grad student read, read them every month, and everybody knew what was in them. Okay? Nowadays, you know, go onto the internet and type in, you know, journal and just a keyword, computer, and back comes 400 hits. 
Okay, there's lots of publication venues. So there's lots of possibilities for people to publish the same thing multiple times. And editors, of course, don't like that because they want originality. So they're very much concerned with whether this has been published before, whether it's by you, or whether it's by someone else. So has it been published? Where was it published? Okay. With the respect to the material that isn't original, they're concerned with citation for the same reasons we talked about earlier. Can a reader find what's in here? Okay. Can a reader take that reference, what a bibliography, bibliographic entry in the back, whatever it is, and find the material and follow up and see if, in fact, what you, you know, your one sentence summary of an entire chapter from somebody else's work is, in fact, accurate? Or whether you misquoted them or whether you cherry picked the one thing in that book that supports your research and ignored the 199 other things that detract away from it. So that's the editor's point of view. What about the funding agencies? Well, they have essentially the same point of view as the editors, but they've got a couple others. And in particular, since they're doling out money, they want to make sure that they're doling it out wisely. So in addition to worrying about whether it's been published before, they're also worried about whether it's been funded before. So are you submitting a grant that is essentially the same one you submitted three years ago? But you just, you know, updated three words and you want some more money from me because you got a new crop of graduate students and you want to be able to pay them. Or are you submitting a grant to me when you've already had similar work funded at another agency? So these are the types of things they're worried about. Okay. So how do they answer those questions? Well, the internet and web-based applications are marvelous things. And what do they do? They use a web-based app. They essentially use a web-based application that enables them to do that searching in as automated a fashion as possible. So there's lots of different pieces of software out there that can do plagiarism detection. They all have certain features in common. But basically, it just all boils down to a giant search engine. Okay. And the question is simply, how efficient is that search engine and against what sources is it looking? So typically, if we're talking about research-oriented plagiarism, we're looking at a database of publications. We're looking in, you know, whether that's sitting behind a paywall or whether that's freely available. Okay. In the case of funding agencies, we're looking at databases of old grant applications and current grant applications. Okay. So those are the kinds of th those are the kind of search parameters or the search sources, I should say, that they're looking at. Once the tool finds a match against those. The task from that point forward is to make the research process associated with that as efficient as possible. So typically, it's going to annotate the document somehow. It's going to display it. It's going to color code it. Say, OK, these five words came from this source, and this paragraph came from this source. And click here, and you can up and pop and see the source. That's the sort of information that it's going to show. Okay. And in the case of turn it in and authenticate, you obviously get a score, a number. And that number, you got to take with about a half a shaker of salt. Okay? So these are generally called plagiarism detections, but frankly, that's a very poor word for them. Why are a very poor uh, phrase to describe them? Why? Well, because really, all a search engine is doing is looking for matches. So yes, there is another source somewhere out there in a journal or an internet that has exactly the same eight words that you have in exactly the same order. That's a match. And it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to go out looking for a match. OK, we've had computer science researchers working for 50 years figuring out efficient algorithms to do that sort of thing. Now we've got tons of computer power we can throw at it, in nice fast networks. So you know, instantly, or not, or nearly instantly, you can search billions of documents and find those matches. Okay? But the match by itself does not tell you that plagiarism has occurred. Plagiarism is a judgment call. Just because there's a match doesn't mean it's plagiarism. For starters, you've got that one very basic question, that one very basic thing that gets you out of the plagiarism trap, which is, did you properly cite it? And you might think, well, aren't these tools smart enough to know what has and has not been properly cited? You'd be wrong. Okay. Yes, you can configure one of these tools to say, well, look for things in double quotes, or look for things in single quotes, or look for things that have a little bracket or a little set of parentheses after them. But you know, the, 
knowing what's been cited, what's been cited properly, that's a little more difficult than simply a text match. Text matches are easy. Google, Bing, you know, pick your search engine. They do them every day. Okay. So the big distinction I want to make here, both to you as users of plagiarism uh, detection software, or I should more correctly say originality checking software, and to the folks you're marketing to, the journal editors, the funding agencies, your, doc, your thesis committee, or your dissertation committee, it's important to remember that this is a judgment call. That the match by itself is not evidence. Well, it's not definitive evidence. OK, so talking about the available tools. Well, first off, you can do this yourself. And I used to do this myself with student papers in the pre, you know, basically in the early Google days before anybody thought to package you know, this sort of thing together in a plagiarism or originality detection. You know, you're sitting there, you're reading through that stack of papers, and you know, it's a junior level class or a sophomore level class, and you get to the middle of that one and you just see that golden paragraph that just doesn't fit, just sounds too polished. So what do you do? You pop up your search engine, you type in a few choice keywords of for, or hit, you hit enter and you see what pops up. And that's when you find out that, gee, that entire paragraph and the five around it were all lifted directly from fill in the blank. Okay. So that's one way to do it. And it works. The disadvantage, of course, is it's rather inefficient if you are, say, uh, a journal editor receiving you know, 200 submissions a month, or if you're, say, a mini track chair who's working in a conference and is looking at 40 or 50 submissions, or if you're, say, a program officer at the NSF, which might be getting, or the NIH, which might be getting hundreds or thousands of um, these a month. So you need some efficiency. You need a tool that's really designed, optimized for workflow, as we would say in the business school. And for better or worse, and well, I, I shouldn't make a judgment call on it. For better or worse, you're pretty much down to one choice in the marketplace. There is one market leader here. The company is called iParadigms, and they basically have two different tools, one called Authenticate, which is for research use, and one called Turnitin, which is primarily for classroom use. Okay, And it's Authenticate that we're going to talk about here today. How am I doing for time? Okay, thanks. So, with all the tools of which, I, of which Turnitin and Authenticate are just examples, uh, you got the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what's the good? Text matching, they got it. They got it down. Okay. Text matching algorithms, you know, people have been working on that for 50 years. Okay. Plenty of computing power to throw at it. And it's not just exact matches. They do very well with, phrase, you know, with, with uh, paraphrasing. They do very well with you know, moving words around. Uh, some tools even do pretty well with matching, again, in multiple languages. Okay. So text matching, no problem. Okay. The bad, well, it's a tool. And especially for things like paraphrasing, no tool's perfect. I mean, you ever go in and get a medical test and it comes back positive? And of course, you go into immediate paranoia, but then you talk to the doctor, and the doctor doesn't seem all that worried. You say, well, doc, why aren't you all that worried? And the guy says, well, you know, this test is right about 60% of the time. <laughs> and it's wrong about 30% of the time, you know, or vice versa. And so, of course, sorry. Thanks. Got about five minutes, and I got a noisy phone here. So you've got both type 1 and type 2 error. And there's, just, there's no way you're going to get around that. You know, you've all had a statistics class. As one goes up, the other goes down. You tune the algorithm, but you know, you've always got to trade off between the two. Okay. Second issue, images and sounds, they're still working on it. They're getting a lot better. But images and sounds are, are problems. Okay. So the figures, did you steal that? Well, you know, hard to say. Can they match a JPEG to the original BMP? You know, did somebody doctor it? Did they brighten it? Did they change contrast? Did they squish it down? You know, those sorts of things can fool image recognition algorithms. Okay. Uh, the big thing, the big problem I see, and this is more for classroom use than research, although increasingly it applies to research as well, we're still stuck in this quote unquote paper mode. You know, we publish a paper. You know, we print it out, it's got 18 pages, we stick a staple in the upper left-hand corner. That's a paper. 
But in the modern world, lots of things aren't papers. They're collections, they're bodies of work, they're blogs, they're websites, they're integrated groups of papers. They're papers plus an application, plus a data set, plus a visualization, plus a PowerPoint, plus a, a YouTube video, you know, all those things together. And the tools that exist today are not particularly good at dealing with those things as a collection. Yeah, if you feed them the text pieces one at a time, they'll do fine. But you can't just point them at a URL of a blog and say, original or not. Okay? They're not that sophisticated yet. They're getting there. Okay? The ugly part, this goes back to the idea of plagiarism being a judgment call. If you simply set up an algorithm that says, OK, I'm going to look for every originality score above, and you pick a number, 25, 50, 13, whatever it might be, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Okay? And if the journal or the funding agency you, you, uh, you submit your work to does that, they're going to make a lot of mistakes. And maybe you're going to be on the wrong side of one of those mistakes. OK, so let's talk about Authenticate at UNM. I'm going to skip over some of the details, so I'm not going to walk through a, a hand. Uh, I'm not going to walk through a, a, a detailed example here. Uh, we bought Authenticate two years ago. Uh, usage on campus, slow. There's probably you know, four, five, six dozen papers a month going through here all over campus. Uh, and it's one of these things I can't figure out why. It's free. You want to use this. Why isn't it being used? Well. You know, you built that better mousetrap, but they just didn't beat a path to your door. So maybe i got to go back to those marketing professors and say, <laughs> gee, can you help me here? Um, we're currently negotiating the renewal. Uh, I am pretty sure we will wind up renewing Authenticate. Uh, Office of Vice President of Research likes Authenticate and is willing to put some money up for that. Whether or not we'll re renew turn it in, that's a much bigger question at this point. But Authenticate will be around. Uh, if you want to get to Authenticate, go to authenticate.unm.edu. Okay? That'll bring up a page, describes what the tool is, and over on the right side of that page is a big old bright, big right, bright, bright red button that says something, register here, something like that. Register there, type in a few items of information, and bang, an account will be created for you automatically. You then go to authenticate.com and register with that account, and you're in. No money changes hands, no delay, it's pretty fast. Okay. So let's see, I'm going to skip forward here a bit. So here's an example of an originality report. Um, UNM Gen Cyber, we're going to run for the second time, we're going to run a, sub a summer camp for high schoolers. Two weeks, we're going to bring them in and we're going to teach them how to hack. We're going to make them dangerous. We're going to make them cite why. We're going to make them sign white hat, white hat ag hacker agreements first. Uh, last year, we kind of did it with some internal funding. This year, NSF said, gee, we've got some money for this. Why don't you apply? So what I did this morning is I ran the pre-proposal, which was just three pages, through Authenticate, just to see what would come up. And uh, not a lot of matches. You'll see up in the right-hand corner, 3%. That was my originality score. So I did very well if 3% actually means something. But is if, I, if I were to page through the document, and you can't really see it here because of the uh, contrast on the screen, but uh, certain passages would be highlighted and they would be keyed to the one through five there on the right. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. So here, for example, here's a highlighted piece of text. I clicked on it and up popped the source. Okay. Here's the excerpt, and you'll notice it thought that this was a paraphrase of this. The purple highlights it, okay? And that might have been the case, although if you read through it, you see it's not a very exact match, okay? But more importantly, I've got the reference here, and if I want to see the whole thing, I just click here, and in a brand new window, up pops the entire source, okay? So basically, the document has pre-highlighted for me all the matching text, and I can just go through it very quickly and click, 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 and up pop it, and look at it myself and say, ah, did I forget to cite something? Did I accidentally steal something? Did I purposely steal something and forget about it? You know. So using a tool like that, you can very efficiently identify some instances of what might be plagiarism. I'm going to do it for time. Almost out. OK, I'm going to go through that one. Let's go right to the summary. Let's just get to the money part here. Okay. 
Editors and funding agencies are using this tool. How many of them? Pretty much all of them. NSF, NIH, all the big boys as far as, uh, as, far as funding agencies and a lot of the smaller ones. And pretty much every journal or conference you would think about sending your information to. Okay, they're all using this tool. Okay, why? Because they all want to answer those questions. We had back several slides. You have access to exactly the same tool. Okay? It's free to you. Okay? Mike Dewar is going to have to write a check come August for it, but that doesn't matter to you. It's free for you. And it's pretty easy to use. As web-based applications go, this is about as simple as it gets. Upload a file, you know, click a button, wait a minute to 20 <laughs> for the report to come out, click another, click another button, it opens it up, page through it. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple, okay, very simple. Don't you want to see what those editors and program managers at the NSF or the NIH see before they see it? Questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so it seems like this tool is a great tool to use, and, not, and you mentioned before that not many departments or colleges are actually using it. You're well, actually, seeing, you're seeing a low percentage. I'm seeing a low percentage of use compared to the number of grad students and faculty on campus. Sure. As far as the breadth of use, it's all over the place. Okay. okay. Um, so, what would be your recommendation on the best time? Because it seems like it's very time-consuming to run a a proposal or even a project through the system, and it, it seems like you would have ten minutes tops. Ten minutes tops. Yeah. Tops. Before you submit your proposal to a funding agency, or well, I would definitely do it before I submit. But when before, like what? If you've got a reasonably complete draft, that's when I would do it. Okay. And the reason I would do it then is because if you've got problems, you want to know about them relatively early. You know and do the fix earlier in the process. I mean, if you want, run it through at the last minute. But me, I'd do it basically as soon as I have a complete, a complete draft of it. That's how I would do it. Your mileage may vary. Did that answer your question? Yes. Other questions? Uh, but I, just remember, I just checked that this morning. I believe the limit is 400 pages and 400 megabytes. So, and of course, if that's too, if that's a problem for you, break it up into pieces and run each piece through. Uh, if it had needs, is that likely to affect my drive that if I don't have sufficient space in my drive, I don't know if it has something to do with Well, you're uploading the paper to the tool, and then the tool's doing the search in the cloud. So it's not like you're, you know, you're not going to sit there and watch your battery heat up and your, <laughs> you know, your power level drain down. You're just going to sit there and wait for that little icon to change that says reports ready. Is it a good idea to remove the references before sending or you can send it? No, send it with the references. There's actually, there are several ways to configure this. And one of, one of the most basic things you can do is say either ignore the bibliography or check it. Okay. I usually leave the bibliography in for a check and simply realize my similarity score is going to be a little higher because of that. But I frankly want to see if there's bibliographic similarities. Okay. It depends on the nature of the work. But I would say for, for typical research-oriented work, I would recommend leaving the, biblio leaving the checking of the bibliography on. It's a web-based application, so there's nothing to install on your machine. Just go to authenticate.unm.edu, and on that page, click on the red button on the right side to register. Then go to authenticate.com and log in with whatever credentials you created in the previous step. And at that point, you're not actually running anything on your machine except a web browser. Who'd I miss? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> If they're doing research papers, you want to authenticate for them to use themselves. Okay. okay. The, the argument for Turnitin is that it's, it's highly optimized for classroom use. So if I'm an instructor and I'm managing students submitting 50 papers, it handles that scenario very well. 
whereas an individual student looking at one paper, it doesn't make any sense to go through Turnitin. And plus, Turnitin is, may not even be here next year for them to use. But Ithenicate will be. Was there a question over on this side? One more sure. Yeah, they look, they look pretty similar. And, it, and of course, they're, they're from the same company, so the underlying search engine is, is pretty much identical. The nature of the originality report and how you navigate through them, very similar as well. I mean, they're, they're essentially, you know, they're the same system customized to two different workflows. Okay? The other big difference is on Turnitin, you can, you can have the submissions added to a giant repository of student papers which makes it very handy if you want to catch things like the student who reused their brother down at NMSU's term paper from last year, or the purchased paper that's been used by 20 different students. First person will get away with it, but the other 19 won't. <laughs> words were highlighted, and I decide to ignore that. Uh, is there any kind of implication for that? I guess it depends on the words, but I mean, based on the sheer volume, I would say no, but you know, maybe those were the most important <laughs> words in the, in, in the entire uh, present, in the entire paper. I mean, and that's why I say it's a judgment call. It really is a judgment call. I'm going to go ahead and break in here. Uh, if you'll notice, we are recording these, and uh, we are hoping that Within a couple of weeks, they'll be edited and up on the AIR website, so you can you can review this content and, and mostly the slides will be uh, uh, visible at that point. Or you can contact Dr. Bird anytime. B U R D at unm dot edu. He, he is the, the plagiarism expert. No, I shouldn't say that. I the, uh, <laughs> the, what, what's the tool? The, uh, the uh, originality tool expert. Originality. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yes, if you got any questions, follow up with me. I'll be glad to answer. Thank you.